Thank you very much for coming out tonight and spending your evening with us. I, uh, I want to do something a little bit different this evening. I want to sort of uh, talk a little bit about general foot and ankle conditions, but I also want to take you behind the curtain a little bit, okay? I want to show you some of the things that we do in the operating room. Some of the slides are a little bit on the graphic side, but I'll give you some warnings. So if you don't want to look, you can close your eyes. But I want this to be an opportunity not only for you to learn a little bit about foot and ankle disorders, but a little bit to see how we correct some of these disorders and some of the technologies that we have available here at Washington Orthopedic Center at Providence Centralia Hospital. Uh, I merged with this practice about six, seven months ago now. It's been a very pleasant opportunity for me to partner with the expertise of the physicians here at Washington Orthopedic Center. We have really some vastly uh, experienced surgeons on staff here. We are a U.S. ski team facility. Dr. Slattery is a consultant for the U.S. ski team. We have fellowship trained uh, people in spine. We, do, we really do the full gamut of orthopedic care from head to toe. And uh, we have the opportunity to, to work closely with the hospital. And we also have ambulatory surgery here in the office as well as MRI. So we were able to sort of take care of everything needed to be uh, done head to toe in this office. So I do want to talk a little bit about a new piece of technology that we have at Providence Centralia Hospital that we're very pleased to, to be offering, which is a SPECT CT scanner. And, and this is a piece of technology that I first uh, started utilizing when I was a surgical fellow in Liestal, Switzerland. Okay, so this is one of the world's leading uh, centers for ankle joint replacement. And what we were working with was a specialized CT scanner there that combines images with a bone scan and superimposes those together with a CT scanner. So that we get the information available uh, on what's going on in the metabolic level with the bone, as well as a three-dimensional ability to reconstruct those images with a CAT scan. And so that's also very, very helpful in cardiac cases. And, and there are very, very few hospitals around the country, actually, that have this scanner available. So I believe that it's available in Tacoma and maybe in Seattle, but we've fought very hard to get that here locally. And I think that's gonna be a wonderful thing for our hospital. So uh, without further do, we're going to move ahead here. So just a little bit of, again, I joined this hospital staff in 2002. I joined the late Dr. John McCord. Uh, started here at Washington Orthopedic Center uh, in 2014. So how did I become interested in foot and ankle surgery? Well, that's me. Let's show you a little picture here. That's me as a little guy. So I was actually born with a club foot. So this has been a lifelong interest of mine, um, kind of a passion since I was a little guy. Um, not much recollection of my earliest years, but I do remember some of the surgical stuff and going through that at age two and having my cast change and thing. I'll tell you, if somebody comes at you with a cast saw at age two, I don't care how young you are, you will always remember that. So this is just a little bit of a slide that I always thought was very interesting. This is a quote by Leonardo da Vinci, that, and these are some of his drawings actually, is that the human foot is a masterpiece of engineering and a work of art. And it definitely is. We're dealing with a situation here where we have a structure that's composed of you know, 20 plus bones, hundreds of ligaments or 100 and plus ligaments, mul multiple muscles, and joints that all have to function together to allow us to walk. And it's an important part of our daily lives, obviously, for any of those who've been incapacitated. So just a few brief facts. The average person actually walks about 1,000 miles a year. Uh, one hour of running transfers about a million pounds of force through the feet. So if we Every step we take is about two to three times our body weight. So if you weigh 200 pounds, you're getting six to 700 pounds of pressure. If you've ever been injured, you wonder why it takes a while to get better. Imagine how much force accumulates over just a half an hour of walking or even sort of to and from the bathroom. Okay, So over 11 million office visits per year due to foot and ankle disorders. I think I see 10 million of them. <laughs> so, our foot and ankle problems common. How many of you have had foot and ankle problems? I'm going to imagine almost every hand's going to go up or you wouldn't be here. Quite a few. Okay, very good. So, 90% of Americans at some point will have a foot and ankle problem that will require them to seek the physician's services. So, that's tremendous. Okay. So, foot and ankle pain. Again, 50% of Americans will miss a day of work due to foot and ankle pain. Foot pain is not normal and should not be ignored. I think that makes sense. There's a certain point where it gets to the point where you essentially can't ignore the pain anymore, correct? Okay. There are certain things like orthotics, for example, inserts that can help you walk more effectively, can reduce some of your pressure. So this is uh, Switzerland. This is where I went and did my fellowship in 2008 and 2009. I was at six, in six cities in Germany and Switzerland, had the opportunity to work with some of the world's leading experts in various types of techniques. And this is how hard I worked. You know, this is kind of my backdrop there. <laughs> 
but, but we did uh, we did have the opportunity to do a lot of cases in some very interesting places and at the same time to go and see some interesting places like the Matterhorn. This is uh, Professor Beat Hinterman who developed the Hintegra total ankle replacement, which is one of the most commonly used around the world. And he's developed this and put in more than 800 of these replacements. So that makes him one of the world's leading experts at this point. He's published textbooks. We actually, um, one of my, myself and one of my colleagues just finished writing a chapter for a textbook on ankle replacement and kind of expanding the indications. Right now, ankle replacement is a good procedure. It's approaching almost equivalent in the literature to the outcomes associated with fusion. I don't know about you, but the opportunity to have my ankle still moving sounds pretty pleasant as opposed to having it locked and fused. That joint's there for a reason. So there are some differences in ankle joint replacement when you're comparing these to knee and hip replacements. Okay, knee and hip replacements may last you 25 years. It can last even upwards of that. Ankle replacements don't tend to last that long and we're working hard to advance the development of this to enhance the efficacy of these and to get some better longevity out of them. Um, so typically we use these in patients who are a little bit on the older side a little bit on the lighter side. They're not good for big, heavy people who are extremely active because they tend to wear out, okay? This is another picture of Switzerland and you know the technologies available there are really approaching what we have in the US. So some of the techniques we have to be able to reconstruct people's deformities and realign their ankles, realign their feet, to give them the opportunity to walk. Our goal is to create a stable foot for people to walk on. This is a heel bone fracture. That's how we repair those. This is a children's fracture where they've smashed their heel bone. So you can see some of the different types of devices that we use to stabilize. Some of the deformities we've seen, this is a patient I saw when I was a fellow in Germany. It's a neurologic deformity where their tendons are contracted. Look at this one, unbelievable. So I worked with a man named Wolfram Wentz over there and he's an amazing guy. He's done about 2,000 cases of this type of deformity, of this degree of deformity. And when we were finished with this, he was actually able to unwind that foot without having to remove any of the major bones from the foot, but simply by doing tendon transfers and repositioning the foot. So what conditions do we treat? Well, I'm working on a condition to gain some height. We have not uh, actually figured that out quite yet. <laughs> but, uh, you know, every once in a while we do run into people that make us feel like we're pretty short. So skin lesions, you know, I, the reason I point this out, if I can impart anything, don't ignore skin lesions. These are both actually melanomas. These are both patients who came to see me. That, that picture on the left is fairly benign, isn't it? Okay. And so that's a, actually a melanoma. Toe deformities, little crossover deformity. It doesn't look like much, but if you're having difficulty walking and it's creating pressure on the adjacent toe, that makes it very difficult. If you're able to do some little plastic surgery techniques, do some tendon transfers, and reposition that. Okay? Children's deformities, one, two, three, four, five, six. Double toe. Flat foot correction. This is a girl who came to me from Canada for correction. So this, just by doing a simple insert into the joint there, we were able to restore her arch. Fracture surgeries. We do a lot of trauma surgery here at Washington Orthopedic Center. One of the things I'm most interested in is cartilage repair and working on advanced cartilage techniques. You know, when we damage our cartilage, that's the beginning of the end, isn't it? It's the start of the downfall. What's arthritis? It's damage to the cartilage. Okay, this is a slowly progressive condition where cartilage gets chipped away and as time goes on, it's like a tumbleweed rolling downhill. Well, this is a surgical intervention for a patient who developed, a, a, has unfortunately sustained a fall, chipped their cartilage, and this little fracture fragment had flipped around, so we were able to remove that. Okay, and you can see that piece once it's removed, okay? Once we take that little cartilage divot out, so that's what cartilage looks like, okay? See the thick cartilage here and the underlying bone? And that MRI shows a nice little cup-shaped lesion here, right there where that divot was taken out. So we can actually take now, believe it or not, juvenile particulated cartilage. They look like little chiclets. These are donated pieces of cartilage that unfortunately come from, from children who have passed away, and it's a donor graft, and we're able to go in arthroscopically through this little tube, which is about the size of a pencil, believe it or not, and implant cartilage in these defects and restore function. Trauma surgery, fractures, again, people fall. This is a gunshot wound that we took care of here at the hospital. Ankle fracture surgery, innovations in how we take care of these things. We're constantly working on ways to improve the delivery of trauma surgery. Movement is life. We like people to move. When you're, in, and when you're immobilized, you lose muscle, 
And when you're older, you lose muscle, you become weak, it's hard to come back from those types of injuries. Deformity reconstruction. You can see this patient on the right, fairly deformed. This is a post-operative view on the left of actually a foot that was worse than what she had on the right. We started with the worst foot. So we can fix these things. We use frames in some cases to do advanced surgery to help patients be able to transfer on advanced deformities, okay? Reconstruction of deformities where we use things such as a retrograde nail where we open joints up, reposition them, we shoot a nail up through the bottom of the heel, okay? This helps things heal. This is a bone tumor in a young girl that we took care of, okay? Complex lower leg and ankle fractures, very common things. Here's a nice slide of an ankle joint replacement. I wanted to take the opportunity to show you guys exactly what an ankle joint replacement looks like. So in this particular case, this is the Integra that we talked about. This is, shows you where we are in the United States. This particular device has been available in Europe now for more than 10 years, and we still don't have the first iteration of it here in the US. So we have other types of ankle replacements, but it's very difficult to get these devices through the FDA approval. If most of the uh, work has been done in Europe, it's difficult to get them through. So this is showing a realignment of the tibia, okay, has to be straight before you can put these in. That's one of the important things with the ankle, is it needs to be perfectly balanced before we put it in, okay? If it's not balanced, it'll wear out quickly. Okay, so that's a balanced ankle replacement. That center of plastic there is what we call a meniscus, essentially that inlay, that tibial tray there, right here, and then this plastic portion was actually uh, what allows that to glide back and forth, and then that metal portion allows us to put a cap over top of the talus bone. So minimally invasive surgery, we're always working at ways to do things through smaller incisions, if it's the best way to do it, okay? There's not always the case where it's the best way to approach it, but you can see here, doing a calf lengthening where we're releasing that tendon, and you can see the muscle underneath there. That's been totally released now, and you can see that. This is our traditional incisional approach, and that's what we're left with there, essentially, is that tiny little poke hole with one stitch, okay? That's what that looks like when we're doing it. Arthroscopic surgery, we were able to clean out these joints through small incisional approaches. We did two of them here in our surgery center yesterday where people are able to have their ankles stabilized and go home same day. So another thing I wanted to point out to you is the opportunity to get 3D CT scanning here at Centralia Hospital. So this is a case of a fracture of the ankle. And you can see here, this doesn't look too bad. A little crack through the ankle. Doesn't look like it's that out of position. We may treat that non-surgically in the right patient. But when we get a CAT scan on this, what do we see? Three-dimensionally, it lets us take that bone, lift it on end, and look at it from a different vantage point. And in this case, we can take it into a three-dimensional reconstruction. We can see that's a fairly involved fracture that extends into the joint line there and has a little bit of displacement. And there's another look at a three-dimensional image of the CAT scan, okay? So this is the ankle joint here, the outside ankle bone, the leg bone, okay? So again, cartilage replacement. You can see here where you've got a divot in the ankle cysts, cartilage injury. So we're able to take a cadaver talus bone, which is the same bone that we're using here. We're able to take a segment of it and actually replace that. Okay, so this is a scary picture. Anybody who's squeamish, cover your eyes. Warning, fair warning. Cartilage defects in the ankle. So here's actually looking inside the ankle with this particulated cartilage, where we take down, cut down the side of the ankle, remove these cysts, fill it with bone graft. Here's the little hole inside the ankle, okay? Remove it, backfill it with bone graft, and then put this particulated cartilage on top of that to try to resurface the ankle to improve the patient's functions. Deformities, this is a patient who had prior surgeries done in Iowa that I took care of. Neuromuscular conditions, that's where that patient's foot sits on the ground, believe it or not, or doesn't sit on the ground, rather. Challenges, failed fusions. Infections, that's an infected total ankle replacement that had to be removed and filled with a large cement spacer filled with antibiotics, where over time it can uh, try and kill the infection locally where we can replace place it. <coughs> Dislocations where this talus bone has actually been removed from the foot entirely. Sometimes we get lucky, these terrible fractures that come in through our clinic. Absolutely pulverized, you can see this. So this is not something we can easily salvage with the exception of a fusion type procedure where we're able to use a rod and stabilize things. 
So sometimes we get some difficult complications to deal with. This is a deep infection here where the bone has been eaten away. And you can see this rod that was placed is now pistoning out of the bottom of the foot. Okay. You can see here in this case where they fixed a fracture, but this whole side has sheared off where the bone is sheared off. Another infection here where the bone has been eaten away. Infection is a tough problem that we deal with on a daily basis in orthopedics and foot and ankle surgery. Severe bunion deformities. Here's a patient that we did a correction on. How many of you have had trouble with bunion deformities? Pretty common, you know. It's interesting to me. I was talking to a patient today about bunion deformities and how, you know, we're not necessarily born with a bunion, but we're maybe born with a, trend, a tendency or a trait towards forming a bunion. Maybe it's a foot type or a way we walk. It's not due to the type of shoes. Shoes may irritate it, but you know, they've got slides of patients from the, from the uh, Aboriginal areas in Australia, New Zealand. They've never worn shoes in their lives and they have bunions. Okay, so you can see this particular patient here, large angle. So that's just not all new bone formation. It's actually a new gap formed by that bone moving out of position. You can see that so much so that the pressure created the toe situation here where it's dislocated. So this is after realigning that nice and parallel again. You can see the toe without doing any surgery to it actually relocated on its own. Very strange. And this is clinically what it looks like afterwards. Okay. Here's a fusion case. This is a patient who had advanced arthritis, okay? So this patient had had this work done and their talus bone died. The blood supply was cut off, so it wasn't able to heal and eventually it collapsed. And that's a difficult situation because you don't have any ability to walk like that and your ankle joint is now completely destroyed. So after two months of trying to fuse that with a bone graft, it didn't take. Four months later, the screw's broken, the rod's backing out, and it's falling apart. So in this particular case, six, six months later, after another revisional surgery, rather than amputating the leg, which was recommended elsewhere, it was salvaged by taking a portion of a patient's hip, the ball from the patient's hip, and putting it in the ankle joint and using a retrograde rod to fuse that successfully. Again, cover your eyes, fair warning. Achilles tendon rupture. This is a patient who came to my office who'd had a huge gap in their Achilles tendon from an unrecognized rupture four months prior. So that's a big dilemma. There's a huge gap in there, right? That's maximum tension there to get that together. And you can see we have several centimeters of gap. So I actually reconstructed that using a cadaver graft. Okay, so you can see that bridged nicely. A few complex cases and how we manage complications. So this, I want to take you behind the curtains and show you, not everything always goes perfectly with surgery. 80% of the time, under the best circumstances, surgery turns out well in foot and ankle. That's a published statistic. You said 80%? 80%, okay. I'd like to think ours is a lot higher, and I think it is. But what I'll tell you is, it's not if you do the surgery correct, it's if you do the surgery correct and something goes wrong, can you fix it, okay? So people don't like to talk about complications, but I'm gonna share a couple complications of mine and show you how I fix them, okay? So this is a gentleman who's 340 pounds. He had a surgery to correct a diabetic foot ulceration. How many of you are diabetics in here? Few, very common problem. So diabetics because, get numb feet. You all know diabetics. They get numb feet, they develop wounds, and they can lose their legs. So we try to preemptively take care of these problems by changing the position of their foot and reducing pressure. In this particular case, he had a chronic ulcer under the bottom of his first metatarsal. So we lifted that up and we repositioned his foot so that he wasn't getting as much pressure under this area. And in this particular case, I thought everything was going great. Everything looked good. Six months later, I'm in New York for a meeting and I get a call. Dr. Dujel, I'm sorry to bother you, but your patient showed up in my office today and took an x-ray and it didn't look so good. And so the worry begins. Broken hardware. Look at this position. That's a devastating complication. So we know that diabetics don't heal well in some cases, and this is an example of what happens. So this patient had not healed his fracture, and he was walking on it, or this, this bone cut and was walking on it, and he developed some complications. And so you can see here a little bit of gap. As he continued to walk on it, it broke and it slipped. And he's 340 pounds. And the options now are dismal. How do we fix this? So the position's terrible. So in this particular case, I was able to satisfactorily realign this with three large screws. Looks good. Everything's back in order, OK? So how does he do? Six months later, what do we see? The gap's back. 
the screws are bent, it's not healed. Okay. So that's where he started on the right, and that's where he is on the left. So now the heel bone has multiple holes in it because we've done two screws initially. Now we've done three screws in a different direction. This is a CAT scan showing that it's not healed. See the line through there? The line through there. Some people just don't like to heal no matter what kind of bone graft and specialized products that we use on them. Stem cells, all types of things. So in this particular case, we were able to free it up, clean it up, take cultures to make sure it wasn't a deep infection that was the cause of this, and then use this halo type device to try and get him to heal. Now the benefit of this is instead of coming through the back of the heel, we're coming side to side through the heel, and we use these tensioned wires to kind of hold everything together. And he came together and he healed beautifully in the end. And that's a picture of him there. He gave me position, permission to use his picture. So this is a second case. This is a 74-year-old gentleman whose position of his leg is terrible. He had surgery done 30 years ago. And he's getting tremendous pain in his leg. And what you can see here is that his foot is fused in front of his leg. And if you look at this side view here, you can see it's fused in an angle. Ideally, we'd like to see that straight. So persistent pain, swelling, inability to walk. This is a guy who likes to hunt. So he's got a non-healed fusion site here. That's causing his pain, and he's got a poor position. This is a tremendously difficult case. In this particular case, the leg fusion site was actually cut through, repositioned, held together with screws, refused, and a frame put over top of that to allow that to heal in a better position. And that's what he ended up with afterwards. So we can see two years post-operatively now, nice straight position. You can see, it doesn't look like the same leg, but you can see those two little dots there showing it's the same guy. This is an interesting patient, a 65-year-old patient. She was not diabetic, but this is very typical of what we would see in a diabetic patient, a large wound. This right here, anybody have an idea what that might be? This is actually her foot bone protruding. It looks like her ankle. But that's actually the bone in the foot here that's dislocated. You can see the whole foot is dislocated here. And so that is a big, big foot to work with. So I was able to actually reposition that and fuse it. Okay, and you can see there the difference with what we started with and able to get that foot back into correct alignment. Importantly, so that that patient, you can see the before and the after, how we've been able to restore the anatomy, can then continue on and walk. This is a patient who had a nail. This device talk that we talked about for fusion that went on not to heal. She was done elsewhere. She was referred into me. And you can see here this fracture that has occurred. This is the nail. This is a CAT scan. And you can see lots of bone loss around here. There's big voids. Okay, so the heel bone is now split in two and we've got a non-healed fusion here. So what did we do? All right, so this is basically what happened. We took the nail out. We took a large graft right here again from a cadaver's hip socket and we filled in this large bone loss and then all of this material in here was filled in with bone graft with large screws securing that all together and a plate and screws to try and hold that all together to heal and eventually she was able to consolidate that together and thankfully was able to walk so we see some significant difficulties and finally things like birth defects this is believe it or not a cerebral palsy child i don't say child lightly he's 16. In the U.S., we don't typically see people age 16 walking on their toes. These people are usually corrected when they're children. This may be something we see in the third world, but not here. The story here, unfortunately, is that this patient's mother didn't allow him to have surgery when he was young because she was afraid that it was summertime and that he'd have odor associated with his cast. So he went throughout his life carrying the name Gimp. So that's where we finished. Deformity correction. The scal, progressive deformity, was in a wheelchair. We fixed her right foot there, you can see. And now she came in for her left foot. So we can see here, that's how her foot sat on the ground. And this is due to contracture of the muscles on this side of the ankle, okay? And this is what the x-rays look like. So this actually shows so much rotation of her foot that that's normally what we see when we look at a side view of the foot. And this is the top of her ankle joint. So her ankle was actually dislocated sideways like this. This is a challenging case. And I wanna show you kind of stepwise how we take care of this. Okay, so again, just a few surgical slides. If you wanna close your eyes, you're not interested in watching this. But 
basically this is sort of what we did on her other side. And you can see the, the change in position from that foot being fully rotated around to what she was able to get on this side. But this particular one was a little bit harder. Okay, so we had to open up her ankle joint and take a large wedge out of it. We release her Achilles tendon to lengthen it. We open up the inside portion of her ankle joint. We transfer tendons from the inside portion of her ankle that are pulling it inwards around the back of her leg through to the front of the leg to pull that foot to the outside. That's the little incisions we're able to do that through the front of the leg. We take a little wedge out of her ankle to allow us to rotate that around. And this is what those nail devices look like when we put the nail back up to allow that to hold that ankle in position. There's some more tendon transfers that occur and that's when it's all closed up. And that's, that's what she ended up with afterwards, okay? So you can see that foot that's literally upside down and how we're able to rotate that foot around. And importantly, in this case, fuse the ankle joint and the subtalar joint but to keep the rest of her foot fully functional. And she still walks today, and one of my partners recently replaced her knee, and I'm thankful that she's able to walk now. And that's what she looks like standing. And this is a lady who was in a wheelchair for years, okay? So that's, unfortunately my video doesn't walk, but, work, but that was a, a little video of her walking. Let's take a look here. Diabetic, okay, this is for you diabetics. This is one that I wanted to show. This is a patient who was seen at an outside community hospital in one of the smaller communities. She presented with an abscess that had started as a very small callus here, okay? She developed a bit of a fullness in her arch. This is actually a large abscess or pus pocket because she had developed this hole that had tracked an infection back in here. This is because she was not getting regular diabetic care. She was not getting appropriate workup and watching and monitoring. Diabetic shoes are important to avoid these types of complications, okay? Checking your blood sugar, making sure that you're in good shape, seeing your primary care physician for regular checkups. So her leg was scheduled to be amputated by the general surgeon at this community hospital, and she fled the hospital. She left, she pulled her IV out and left. <laughs> I opened her up and I drained her, and this is obviously was quite a difficult situation to try and rectify, but with wound care and multiple trips to the operating rooms and clean outs, I was able to close that, and this is her 12 weeks later, okay? <laughs> So this is limb salvage, limb preservation. The statistics associated with limb loss are unbelievable. A patient who loses a leg, 50% of the time will lose the contralateral leg, the other leg, within two years. Of those people, 50% are dead within two years. So there's mortality associated with losing a leg. It's not a, just a functional thing. People die from this disease. And so my recommendation is that any of you who are diabetic, if you see a callus on your foot or you see some type of issue, make sure you get it taken care of. Make sure you're in therapeutic footwear. Medicare will cover those shoes for you. Orthotists can provide that. Your primary care physician can write a prescription for those. We're happy to do uh, you know, a prescription for you and an exam to, t to tell your primary care doctor that you need those. And again, that was our gentleman who we did the lengthening on before and after there. Uh, that was one of the best cases we were ever involved with. So again, if you've had friends who've had bad outcomes, we see it all the time, unfortunately, from, from all over, okay? Uh, and, and we don't like to see things like this. There's lots of great work done, unfortunately, and periodically there's some not so great work done. And some of it's circumstance, and some of it patients play a role in, but uh, we wanna help patients however we can. So thanks for letting me take you behind the curtain a little bit. I did, uh, at the request of my son, Christian, he's seven, he, he wants to be a foot and ankle surgeon at some point in the future. And so he drew a little invention of his uh, on how we can improve foot and ankle surgery. So he gave me some little drawings to show you. Thank you. Next, I'm, I'm very pleased uh, to introduce Erin Galarraza, who's one of our physical therapists. She's a doctorate in physical therapy. She's a wonderful addition to our physical therapy staff here at Providence. Um, she's been here now for over two years, and she practices right next door here. If you're aware, we have physical therapy in the office next door. Erin um, is specializing in multiple different areas of physical therapy, enhancing orthopedic rehabilitation, women's care, and sports issues. And again, she has her doctoral degree, and she's going to talk to us about how we rehabilitate some of these crazy surgeries we do. So forgive me for some of the scary slides. I hope that that was an interesting look at what we do sort of behind the scenes that you will rarely get uh, from sort of reading about foot and ankle surgery in books. Thank you.
me. Uh, my name is Erin Galarza, and uh, yes, I'm with Providence, been here for a while. So we're just going to take a brief look into the physical therapy perspective for treating foot and ankle pain. Uh, oftentimes, a lot of you will be referred to us after seeing Dr. Dijell or another specialist uh, for continued rehab. And so with an acute foot or ankle injury, so something that's very recently happened to you, uh, we can use the acronym RICE. Uh, so rest, ice, compress, and elevate. So we'll wanna stay off of the, the injured area as much as you can to help it kind of recover. Ice uh, to the affected area, maybe 15 to 20 minutes, and a little bit of compression, but not too tight so that we cut off circulation, and then elevating above the waist in order to help reduce swelling and manage pain a little bit better. So if you have a little ankle sprain or twist, that can be an easy way to uh, start the rehab process. And so what can we do for you? Uh, physical therapy is great at uh, reducing pain, improving range of motion, strength, balance. Balance is important for all of us. Uh, returning to normal function or our normal sports and various other activities. <coughs> And so if you get sent to us by a physician for any type of physical therapy, really, uh, we're always going to do an evaluation initially when you first come in to see what your impairments are. Um, and we'll do some goal setting, which will be kind of a mutually agreed upon task, and then treatment options. And so in an evaluation, we take objective measures, range of motion, see how well that joint moves, <coughs> strength, sensation, balance, gait or how you're walking, uh, the mobility of the joints. There's many, many joints in the foot, so if one's not moving, that can certainly be a problem for other parts of the foot or even up the chain into the knees or hips. Um, and then the soft tissue, so if you're getting a lot of swelling or anything like that. Uh, with goals, uh, of course, the patient's goals are a priority of ours. Uh, a lot of people, you know, you don't want to walk with a limp, so we're going to work with you to help normalize your gait, um, be able to make a trip to the grocery store, uh, able to stand and fix dinner, or return to some of those favorite activities like golf or uh, gardening. And then in a treatment session, there's lots of different things we're going to work on. Uh, stretching exercises, uh, if you've just come out of surgery, uh, and, and well maybe not just come out of surgery, but if you've been in a boot for a while, let's say, uh, stretching the joint is going to be important. Uh, we're going to do strengthening, and strengthening includes a lot of different things, not just band exercises. We'll do a lot of balance retraining, and we have all kinds of fun ways to retrain balance in the clinic. And then functional tasks like getting back to walking and doing some of those regular activities that you want to participate in. Aquatic exercise, not all clinics have aquatic therapy available. We do have aquatic therapy available across the street and for those people that are appropriate, aquatic exercise can be a great uh, push to help re rehabilitate after an injury, especially if standing on that joint is really painful. Uh, we can get some of that weight bearing off in order to move better and then get better strength and function back. And so in addition to all those things, we're going to mobilize joints if that's something that's needed. Taping, bracing, or other supports like orthotics might be used. Electrical stimulation, um, or TENS as a lot of you may know it as, will be applied often to help with uh, swelling or pain. And then soft tissue mobilization, so scars. Scars can be very painful, but we can loosen those and get some better mobility within the scar to help with pain, and then heat and ice um, as needed. And so shoes, Dr. Dijella mentioned, uh, especially with those that have diabetes, um, how important proper shoe wear is. And so for any of us, whether you have diabetes or not, having the right fit, a comfortable shoe, something with support is going to be important. If you're doing a lot of walking, you want something that's going to help absorb that versus um, being very abrupt feeling when you're walking and then providing you that stability. And so that is all I have for you guys uh, in regards to our perspective. There's lots of different things to consider when doing physical therapy, but that's just kind of our brief overview. Ankle problems, okay? There's a million different things that we see every day in the office. Some of the common things that we see, heel pain, forefoot pain, bunions, hammer toes, 
different types of things like this. We don't do a lot with things like skin and nails and things like that. General podiatry does things like that. We tend to focus more on sports injuries, surgeries, and deformity correction. But the question I have for you guys is, we're here to answer questions now. It's impossible to cover everything in one you know, half hour talk. But I'll stay as long as you want and answer your questions. Okay, so whatever you want to ask, uh, you want some tips, I'm happy to give you tips. Uh, Aaron's got lots of tips for you, ensure on how to get better from some of these injuries. But a lot of it's just weight. We're all fat these days, let's face it. I'm 20 pounds more than I need to be, and I develop heel pain. I'm scared to give myself a shot. That's the problem. I need a shot. So I need myself a shot. Okay. So, Terry. When a person's uh, looking to purchase shoes, mm -hmm. make some recommendations on what they should look at or look for when they're purchasing shoes. Sure. I'll, I'll answer that a little bit. I'll let Aaron take that first. You want to talk a little bit about shoes? Um, I've had a very brief slide there on shoes. So the comfort and support is going to be important and then the right fit. You don't want any, you know, rubbing on your toes, enough uh, space within that toe box region um, and just the proper support so your arch isn't feeling like it's falling in or your foot's turning in or out too far. I don't know if you're seeing what I'm seeing, but what I'm seeing these days is the shoes are minimalist and they're flexible yes. and they're flimsy. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, there's a lot of lightweight shoes out there, but yes, a lot of them um, don't offer enough support because they're too mobile. So you don't want a super stiff shoe that uh, doesn't move for you, but certainly not one that's um, so loose that when you're walking, you can feel all the pebbles and you're rocking back and forth. Exactly. So I like New Balance, not to be a commercial, but I, we've got a New Balance outlet here now over at the outlet mall. Nike has an outlet mall. I like a somewhat structured shoe. People love these minimalist shoes because they're flexible, light, they're easy. You know, it's hard to pick up our feet as we get older, we trip and we fall. But uh, structure is important. So when you take a shoe, it shouldn't be so flimsy. It shouldn't be able to hold it up like a slipper. You, you want some protection there, especially to hold up the arch like yours. Uh, I inherited flat feet. Okay. And uh, my mother had uh, rheumatoid arthritis and was in braces for years and all of that. I'm wondering if uh, that is hereditary or... So arthritis, there can be hereditary components to it. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis is an inflammatory arthritis, okay? It doesn't mean you're going to inherit that. It means that it's destructive. Inflammation eats away at the joint. Mm -hmm. And the end result is the same. Our joints get eaten away just like if we had a wear and tear arthritis. We need things like joint replacements and things. But the answer is, in short, not everybody who has a family member is going to get rheumatoid arthritis. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Nothing additional on that one. <laughs> How about the flat feet part? Uh, flat feet, um, a lot of people have flat feet, feet and it doesn't always uh, indicate a problem or cause a problem down the road. For some people, it does or can, especially with the increased weight maybe as we age, um, but just because we have flat feet doesn't always mean we're going to have foot pain. Exactly. Lots of people who have flat feet that don't have pain, have, there's a difference. There's flat foot and then there's pathological flat foot, an abnormal flat foot. My grandpa had the flattest feet in the world. He never had a day of pain and he always outwalked me when we were out for a jog. <laughs> I've had a plantar fasciitis and following uh, your directions and Dr. Kex, I've been stretching. Okay. And uh, can you overdo the stretching? That's a great question. Not that I have seen. Uh, usually with the plantar fasciitis, there's a, it's, a, it's a long process to come back from, and the stretching takes a long time. It's not an overnight thing to stretch any muscle um, to get any kind of lengthening. It's definitely a prolonged exposure to it. I don't know what your experience has been. When I see people with plantar fasciitis, in my own case as well, is it tends to be recurrent in a lot of people. Oftentimes. And we start feeling better, and we quit doing our stretches, mm -hmm. and it comes back. So our day-to-day -day activities, you know, a lot of this comes down to a tight calf muscle. If you look at tight calf muscle, it comes down, blends with the Achilles, and then blends with the plantar fascia. Because for those of you who don't know what plantar fasciitis is, probably almost everybody in this room has had it at one time or another. This is our cause, most common cause of heel pain. So that stone bruise, that heel spur syndrome, which occurs most of the time actually without a spur. There may be a spur there, but generally the spur is totally inconsequential to the problem. It's a reaction to the inflammation or irritation of that plantar fascia that's been going on for a long time. So my feeling is, is that once you get something like plantar fasciitis, and really all of us should be working on regular stretching programs to stay mobile, particularly as we get older. That's one of the first things we lose our flexibility. Eric could tell you about that. But 
when we get better with our stretches, we make a part of our routine, you'll find that things come back, plantar fasciitis comes back, but it doesn't last as long, it gets better very quickly. So I hope that answers your question. Any thoughts on stretching or recommendations? Uh, the calf stretching, um, for those with pain, sometimes we recommend um, either a tennis ball on the bottom of the foot, kind of like a self-massage to that plantar region, um, or a frozen water bottle, and you can just use that rolling over a frozen water bottle to help with some of that. That's a good tip. Uh, you hear a lot these days about the 3D printer. Is that something that Centralia Providence may use in the future? Well, I think undoubtedly at some point 3D technology is going to become more involved in, you know, in the work we do. Okay, so we are seeing 3D printers for casts and things like that. We don't have that here locally yet, and that's not universally accepted in medicine. But if there is some experimentation. You, know, you read about it in the news where they're trying to 3D print organs, and that's where the future of this goes. You know, print a scaffold, use stem cells to grow around the scaffold. You know, yeah. so that, that's a ways off, but I, I think at some point in the future, if it's going to be available, we'll have it here. That's one of the messages I think I want to tell you about is I practice here. I teach surgery all over the world, okay? What we do here is what they do in Seattle, okay? Mm -hmm. You don't need to go to Seattle to have major reconstructive surgery. We have it here. They have it in Olympia. They have it in Tacoma. There's, there's plenty of places that provide the type of technology needed, and small does not always mean poor quality. Okay, right. and you can see their hospital just won a bunch of quality measure awards. If you take a walk over there, you see some awards for that. So personally, uh, I developed a kidney stone last year, and I live in Olympia. I got in my car and I drove down here. I live five minutes from St. Peter Hospital. I'm also on staff at St. Peter Hospital now, right there. So. Please. Okay. I have um, like numbness and a sharp needle pain like a diabetic, but I'm not. Do you know of something I can do to relieve it? So first off, causes of numbness in the feet, and then I'll let Aaron talk about treatments for things like that. But causes for knee numbness, needly type pains, there's multiple issues that can lead like to that. Diabetes is one of the most common things, but other things like back issues, impingement in the spine. Everything downstream from your spine is affected. Any you've had sciatic type pain, you know that can radiate down your leg. Thyroid disease, alcohol use, certain medication exposures, chemotherapy, vitamin deficiencies, B12. So those can leave you tingly, prickly feeling, okay? particularly at night early on onsets. Yeah. Uh, the problem with this is it progresses if we don't get to the root cause of it, which we can sometimes do and treat it, rectify it. Or correct the underlying disorder, then you end up with numb feet. It's the numb feet that can lead to wounds and things like that that are problematic. So, any thoughts on that? Uh, it just determining, yeah, what the cause is, and so if it's a, a mechanical musculoskeletal issue, um, then having that evaluated through therapy. If it's something stemming from the back um, that can usually be teased out, occasionally peripheral nerves uh, might be involved, but it would just be determining where it's originating from in order to know how to treat it. Sometimes it can be a local nerve entrapment, tarsal tunnel syndrome, similar to carpal tunnel syndrome we can get in the foot and ankle, compression of the nerve. So again, trying to figure out what the cause of it is so you can actually treat it, rather than just trying to mask the symptoms or medications that can make things feel better. But it doesn't really get to the, to the cause of it and it doesn't reverse it unless you figure out why it's there. Yeah, I'm working question. on that, but no one's figured it out yet, so we're still trying. <laughs> Neurology is a good place to start. We're yeah, so it's in March, so I'm waiting for it. <laughs> Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Sir, I've been, di I've been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, and I'm getting nodules underneath the ball of my feet. My rheumatologist tells me don't remove them because they'll just grow back. Now, in the middle of the foot, underneath the ball, there's one, and under the small toe, there's one, but the one in the middle of the foot is the one that's got all the pressure on it, and it's causing a tremendous amount of pain. Mm -hmm. um, by removing it, it's going to grow back again, so have you got any other alternatives to that? So they don't always come back. They do come back, but if it comes to a point where it's you know, so disabling that you can't walk, then it is a consideration to have that surgically removed. Also, if you start to break down, form calluses, form wounds because of that, we will remove them with the risk that, yeah, a percentage of these will come back. The other alternatives to get custom-made orthotics, have an orthotist or a prosthetist. We do orthotics here. We have a three-dimensional scanner. It takes an impression of your foot, takes into consideration where these prominences are, and redistributes pressure to relieve some of those 
Okay, and that type of issue, a lot of times with a multiple layered padded type device that accommodates the pressure over areas of time, you can reduce the pressure and successfully relieve a lot of that discomfort. Well, I tried gel pads. The gel pads don't work. Yeah, I understand. Whole so. different ballgame. This is something that's made specifically for your foot. So those gel pads don't take into consideration that you've got a large prominence on the bottom of the foot. That needs to be teased out or captured with a cast or a three-dimensional scan. So in other words, make an appointment, huh? Well, you can see your family doctor, see an orthotist, there's, we can help you. Okay. Question? Sir. Uh, I'm a supinator and have okay. it for a long time. It affects the way I walk. I used to have orthotics back before I moved here, and I felt so good without them after a time I just threw them away. Now it's hurting bad, it's hurting my knees, I got a disc in it, and if I pack it's bad, it affects that. So do, would I have to have surgery to, to stop the supination or would orthotics most likely fix this issue? So I'll talk about that a little bit about Aaron to address the supination issue and the, the difference between supination and pronation. Well, we don't want to ask you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't have much on that one. I'm still working on keeping all those straight sometimes. So, so, so pronation is this tendency to sort of roll in, okay, collapse in. Supination means we roll to the outside, okay? So there's some people who wear down the outsides of their shoes, there's some people who wear down the insides of their shoes, and they both have their own sets of problems, but they tend to be a little bit different, okay? Supination can be controlled to a degree with an orthotic, okay? It really depends on what the overall foot structure is doing. We call it deformity, a varus deformity. If you've actually got a structural problem, where your foot is curved in, or your lower leg is curved in, it's causing you to put more pressure to the outside. Or if you've got a muscular imbalance. I mean, I always tell patients when we're walking, it's like the reins of a horse. If you're wanting to head straight ahead, it's just like the foot function. As the foot strikes the ground and you're progressing, you need to have a perfect balance. Sometimes we have an imbalance. That's just like sort of when a truck starts to teeter over. Once it gets to a certain point, it goes. So if the muscles are imbalanced in keeping those reins of that horse headed down the road, you can end up with a supination problem. And what an orthotic is, is a device that we apply within a shoe that's made for the shape of your body to help correct those imbalances. In some cases, after a trial was they don't work, and we need to get to the root of why that's happening. Is it a muscle imbalance? Is it a structural problem where the bones are actually contorted or twisted that need to be repositioned with surgery? So that's something that usually is fairly easy to see with uh, alignment radiographs. We take x-rays, check the alignment, not just standard x-rays, but enhanced special x-rays to take a look at those. Sir? I have a question. I use orthotics. Okay. And uh, when I get them made, they use these pressure things okay. to put them on. And lately, they haven't been doing that good of a job. So okay. It would be a good idea to come in and have that. Uh, scan that you do? Are these the soft orthotics or the firm ones? Are they diabetic ones? Or? Yeah. We don't do diabetic type stuff right now. Um, there, are, there are plenty of alternatives, though, in terms of you know, talking to your orthotist, say, hey, this is not quite meeting my expectations. I'm having trouble with these. Uh, sometimes they do the custom-made ones. Sometimes they do the off-the-shelf ones. There, there are other orthotists to see. You know, there are plenty of people who provide that type of technology. We can certainly give you some names of people. Is there a question over here? Yes, I had a question actually on SCAR. She spoke something really quickly about SCAR, helping with scars that are very painful. Yes. And I had my foot fused, and so I've got a scar along the bottom, the heel, along the side of the heel. Well, every time I take a step, that's, it's almost like it's, a, it's, it's crushing together and it's making kind of a lift of the scar. Scar over a scar. Uh -huh. What would you do then on that? We do a lot of scar mobilization, and you could easily work on that at home by, um, you know, applying pressure uh, perpendicular to the scar to kind of get it to move a little bit better. I assume you're fully healed, right? Everything's yes, close up good. Yeah. Then, um, yeah, just some pressure application. Uh, if you're having a lot of sensitivity, you can try different uh, textures of materials to help desensitize it. So starting with a softer material and working towards a rougher, just to, to kind of retrain those nerve sens sensories, uh, sensations to not be so responsive when you're against different materials. But with the, if it's kind of a thickened or firm feeling, you can do mobilization of it. So kind of like a massage to your scar, basically. Okay. If you get a lot of pressure and you're getting thickened skin because of that pressure, some of those soft diabetic style inserts can be very helpful. 
just to clarify, I didn't do your fusion, right? No, you didn't. I, I, I almost, <laughs> that would be a bad question. It wasn't for an ankle replacement, just because my fusion, it, it's very, it's, it's not very good. Your well fusion didn't take well. And it's either. real painful yeah. in walking. Yeah. 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 And this this is, you know, a perfect example of where fusions are a great operation for the right people. Sometimes they don't work out so well. You know, we need motion. Movement's life, right? Again, I'll say that over and over again. Please. Is there anything that uh, one can do to slow down the progression of a bunion? So do you want to I do not know the answer to that. So oftentimes, you, again, looking at the root cause of the bunion, um, depends, okay? So if there's a biomechanical abnormality that leads to that, in other words, things that you're doing abnormally in your gait, tends to roll in, collapse, leading to some instability in your foot. If it's allowing that bone to drift out of position, sometimes an orthotic, a more supportive shoe. Oftentimes what we'll do is work with some spacers between the toes, but these are structural deformities. In other words, this is not just a rub that's causing new bone to grow. This is actually, if you remember from my x-ray, a normal bone that is totally you know, moved into a new position. And there's no way to take that bone and move it back to position short of surgery. Now, that being said, I see bunions all day long that are not symptomatic, just to, hey, I'm here for my ankle pain, but what do you think of this bunion that doesn't hurt? So our goal is to take somebody who has a symptomatic bunion and make it asymptomatic. And a lot of times it's reduction of shoe pressure. I will say that the majority of braces and things that we see over the counter, you know, these things you see in the magazines that are supposed to cramp your toe over, and they're, they're a waste of money. They don't work. There's no literature to support those. So, so just the spacer then? Spacer, ice packs, anti-inflammatory medications. Once in a great, great while, a steroid injection, if there's a, a large prominence there that's fluid-filled and irritated and rubbed by a shoe. But a lot of times, just getting a shoe that's got maybe a little mesh out pouching in that area so you reduce the pressure to the area, appropriate width. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Sir? I have a problem. I had an operation on my left foot and yep. it isn't straight. Uh -huh. And now I have my right foot is really twisted mm -hmm. to the right. Yeah. And I wanted to know how long it would be for me to get an operation and so I could get back to normal duties again so I can be a man again instead of sitting in the house and, yeah. and not having to... Well. If those of you can see what he's dealing with here, huh? would you come forward if you don't mind? We want, we want you to come show. Forward? Yeah. Show the position of the ankle, and, and you know this I've is been, a great I've been example. to you before, and you sent me to a position uh, up in, in uh, Olympia. Up in, so take a look at look at the corner of his ankle here. Can you turn around and just show uh, if you don't mind? So he's got a pretty straight ankle on this side, but look at this. Impossible to walk on this. So <laughs> no, sure, I have, have you tried for racing? I have calluses on the inside of both my heel and my toe. I mean, my, you know, where, where your bunion is. Mm -hmm. Can you walk your foot to the outside like that? Yes. No, I can't. So let's see. It doesn't go that way. <laughs> go yeah. this way. So there's still some flexibility. That can be fixed. That can be fixed. Yeah, I know you can fix it. Three months of recovery. Yeah. But this one didn't, they didn't get this one straight when you sent me up to uh... Yeah. I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do the other one. No, you didn't do it. No. You sent me I'll straighten this one up. You sent me up there and uh, and he didn't get it straight. I probably knew it wasn't going to get straight. Yeah. <laughs> can you straighten the left one out I can too? straighten this one out. Come and see me. We'll take some x-rays and figure out what we can do. But I want you guys to see an example, though, of the incapacitation. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that that's painful to listen to when someone says, help me be a man. But again. if I take my shoe off, you know, I even go further to the, yeah. to the left. Yeah. yeah. And I wear shoes out every two to three weeks. Right here. Yeah. Two to three weeks. Okay. Well, come and see me. We'll get you straight on. And you are a man. I'm going to get you fixed up. Okay? That's the third time. Do that. <laughs> Any other questions? I think we saw some hands, please. Uh, you mentioned New Balance over here. Uh, do they have people there that understand how to fit the shoes? They had good success with their patients who've gone over there. We try to arm patients with you know, a couple of recommendations. It's really difficult to say to somebody, hey, you need to go get a New Balance XXX because a lot of times it just doesn't feel good on your foot. It may look like it'll feel good. They get over there and you force the patient into a corner. So we usually recommend that they visit with the shoe fitters, try on things, 
go there prepared. You should shop at the end of the day when your feet are swollen already. You know, that's a nice little tip. Um, and just try on some shoes and spend some time walking around in there. Don't don't just buy what looks good, buy what feels good, and, and don't get pigeonholed. So I'm, I'm very big on just suggesting brands in general or, say, emotion because of a shoe for someone who collapses a lot. Any other thoughts on shoes? The same thing we've discussed, just the support, comfort, fit, um, really too much roomy toe boxes um, and so the trying on and getting some exposure to them I know some places will allow you to you can buy and wear them at home even outside and bring them back but you have to find the right place that lets you really get that trial period good point I like REI up in Seattle um, REI is in Olympia but I like the one in Seattle I remember I went walk on a walking trip years ago and they have like this little walking path inside you can walk around they've got more shoes than anywhere in the United States, I swear. So there's lots of good shoe stores. Uh, I like some of the shoe stores down in Central or Chehalis here. We've got, I think it's Brunswick's and Bartels carry some shoes. And that, uh, that nice local kind of connection, they spend time with you. It's not such a, uh, I guess, impersonal experience. So, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. New Balance doesn't have uh, on hand the triple X and quadruple X. Triple one. Super wide the shoes. Wide, super yeah. wide. They can order them for you, but it takes time. And it's a challenge. The wider shoes are difficult. You know, keeping the inventory sometimes is, is challenging. Oh. Any questions? Please. Can you tell me um, when you find um, value in having your feet adjusted, say, like from a chiropractor? Mm -hmm. I'm going to defer that to Aaron. <laughs> Again, I am not sure. Um, I don't know what chiropractors do for for the feet per se. Um, I imagine they would see what what's limiting you, but I don't have any direct experience with chiropractic care. So there are a couple of conditions in the foot and ankle. First off, I've made friends through chiropractors. I think it's a valuable adjunct. Uh, I have a couple of conditions with the foot uh, that can benefit from some manipulation. There's a condition called cuboid syndrome, which is pain on the outside of the foot. Kind of a rare condition, but some manipulation techniques that can make that feel better. So, you know, I think it's really dependent on each individual practitioner whether that's going to be of much value. Um, I don't have a lot of experience, to, to be honest with you, but we certainly have patients once in a while who, who swear by it and do see chiropractors where that's a, a portion of the manipulation that gets done for them in their regular chiropractic care. So, another question. So, somebody has a pretty normal looking foot compared to the slide you showed, uh -huh. um, and there's discomfort um, there. Um, how often is that something that is just you find a way to manipulate it? Mm -hmm. I mean, not necessarily driven the foot just around, the but... I can tell you that the vast majority of things that we correct are corrected non-surgically. In terms of the number of patients that I see, to the number of patients who have surgery, it's probably the lowest of any of the orthopedic specialties. Okay? So most of the time, between changing the shoes, changing the footwear, changing the inserts, doing something to kind of uh, uh, just figure out what's out of alignment or what the issue is. Is there a weakness? Is the patient, you know, uh, overweight? Is there something that's contributing superstructurally above the level of the ankle? That's the important thing. A lot of these deformities can stem from something like scoliosis, where you get a hip drop, weakness in the pelvic musculature, pelvic tilt, change the way you walk, throwing more pressure, limb length discrepancy. Yeah, our body's a, a chain, you know, it's a system where everything's connected, so something in your shoulder could affect something in your knee. Um, so having our body in a fairly neutral alignment or figuring out where those weaknesses are to prevent further irritation to those lower joints is important. So the answer is it's, it's highly effective. And, and then on top of that, tell me how skilled you are at looking at someone's, when they're standing there, mm -hmm. We come in with, say, my foot's hurting, and no, I haven't, you know, it doesn't look weird, it's just hurting. Mm -hmm. How, I mean, are you able to do much um, evaluation and say, hey, I really think this is coming from your left shoulder, <laughs> or are you it's all in your head? No, I'm talking about you. Well, I instruct this stuff all over the world. I, I'm pretty good at it. <laughs> no, generally, I don't mean to be facetious. I mean, usually, I think, you know, a foot and ankle specialist, if it's if there's an issue, we're generally able to find what that is. Now, of course, we work as a team. We're an orthopedic multidisciplinary center. 
If there's a knee issue or hip center, I call my partners. This happens every day. We send you to therapists. Mm -hmm. There's limb length discrepancy. We're address addressing that. We're trying to figure out how much it is. How can we affect it? But, you know, again, I, I don't need to be derogatory. And I guess but, I'm but, saying over and above, like, having an x-ray or a, yeah. um, a CAT scan. Exactly. Just, just looking at someone. Like, I go to the chiropractor, and they look at me, and, you know, obviously... My it's more than look. It's gait analysis. You go see people don't stand all day. Functional problems happen when we're moving, okay? It's accumulation of abnormal movement, stress, strain on the joints and the muscles. So if you can identify where the issues are by watching people walk, then oftentimes you can be very successful at fixing them. But you guys do this all day long. Yeah, physical therapists are the musculoskeletal experts um, at finding problems, fixing problems to a degree. Uh, there's a lot of special tests that can be done to kind of help pinpoint where problems are coming from. You know, if we evaluate your ankle and there's nothing wrong with your ankle, we're going to work our way up the chain and see what else might be involved to get to, yeah, the hip, the knee, the shoulder, um, determining what the driver of your pain is. So, you know, if it only happens uh, after you've been sitting in the car for an hour, and that's the only time you experience your pain is when you get out of the car, you know, what is it that you're doing in that moment that's creating that pain kind of thing? Good point. Very good. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. I, I know you to not be a surgeon crazy, but man, those slides. <laughs> Have you switched gears? Just not a surgeon. Are there any advances in the treatment of Morton's neuroma? You told me once that I didn't want to do surgery on it in the near future until the pain got really, really bad. So yeah. I'm just kind of curious, are there any advances in that? There's different types of techniques for Morton's neuroma, uh, whether it be releasing the ligament, taking the nerve the out. Shots. <laughs> yeah. So injections sometimes. Morton's neuroma is an enlargement of a nerve between the toes. You get pain and numbness between the toes. feels like a hot poker between the toes. Difficult problem to get away from. Every step you take hurts. We try not to do the surgery if we can help it because when you cut a nerve, like anywhere in the body, body wants to regenerate. So when you cut that nerve and you remove that segment, the end of it tries to regrow, like it sometimes can become a live wire. We call that a stump neuroma. It happens about 10% of the time. 10% is enough that it's something that gives me pause personally. We don't need to do a lot of neuroma surgery. I do neuroma surgery probably two or three times a year. Okay. Um, so in terms of advances, there are different techniques for neuroma surgery. Most of these have been around for a while. There's nothing too crazy and new about that. But again, no matter what it is, you're either decompressing it or cutting it out. And specifically when you're cutting it out, it can try to regrow. But if it becomes a situation where you've tried orthotics, you've tried injections, activity modifications, changed your shoes, lost weight, <laughs> cut it out. There, there are some other options, sclerosing injections, which is a, an alcohol type series of injections. It's a a specific type of alcohol that's mixed with local anesthetic to destroy the nerve. Yeah. Um, it just feels like a little marble in there. And exactly. Like, and when I've been on my feet for a while, especially if I go shopping on a cement floor like Costco, yeah. yeah, I have to be prepared when I go to Costco. Think about what you want. Don't spend too much time on that cement floor. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to say what? Yeah. So yeah. It might be time to think about that. Yeah. I have um, scoliosis as well, so I was wondering what were the things you were talking about that could be related to that in foot and ankle? What have you seen? So, Karen, you want to talk a little bit about scoliosis or get dropped, different things like that? With the, with the changes within the spine and uh, muscle imbalances that might occur, you know, if your center of mass changes or we get those rotations, depending how significant your scoliosis is, that can certainly change what the pelvis is doing and then being part of that chain translate into the lower extremities. Um, so it's something to consider um, with an evaluation of, you know, how is that affecting you? Are you getting rotation in your pelvis or is your hip not extending well on one side because you can't get there with the rotations and uh, other factors that might contribute to it? So again, it could be a lot of the musculoskeletal components, um, but a further evaluation would have to be done to tease that out. Is that yeah, question? thanks. Chris. So I, I think one point to, to follow up on as we wrap up is, you know, your presentation was really the extremes. Yes. And, and the vast majority of the cases that you see are don't go to surgery. You might talk just a second more. Sure, about that. absolutely. So it's difficult to show in slide presentations 
heel pain. You know, show a picture of someone grabbing their heel. It's not, not so interesting. I think what we want to showcase here is that there is a, a variety of different things that we can treat. We talked a little bit this evening after our presentation about different common conditions that we can treat. Um, these are some of the more advanced things that we treat. You know, over the years we've seen things periodically leave town that we wonder why? Why is this leaving town? You know, we just lectured to 1,700 surgeons on that particular topic last week. You know, and so these are some of the things, the advanced technologies that we offer here at the hospital, and we just wanted to showcase a little bit about kind of different things too. A lot of things, you know, the gentleman who who couldn't walk very well. Can you help me? Can you fix this? Is this something that can be fixed? Is this something that's a brace, or can we actually surgically fix it so I can go on with my life and, and be functional and not be crippled up by it? So we use non-surgical approaches wherever possible. We work with our team. We work with our physical therapists extensively to try and get these things better. If it fails, then we fix them, and we can fix them. Well, I think we want to be respectful of everybody's time. We thank you all for coming over here. I know Aaron and Dr. Joe will both be here to answer your specific questions. But thanks a lot for coming, and thanks for being here.